to see you this morning, and it's good to be with you. We're very glad that you're here. I'm very appreciative for the invitation to be a part of your gospel meeting. I'm looking forward to the week and looking forward to getting to know you better and uh, praising and worshiping our God together. Uh, our subject this morning and our overall theme for the week is going to be good news. And this morning, the good news is you can have a great life. You can have a great life. That is the good news. And there are several things, however, uh, are necessary to eventuate that great life. It it won't just happen, but you have to do certain things and you have to be engaged in certain areas of your life. We'll talk, time permitting, about six things. We'll probably get to three, but we'll move as quickly as we can to try to get to all six. Number one, in order to have a great life, you have to embrace and live with personal responsibility. You have to own your life and be responsible for it. Personal responsibility is taught to us as early as Genesis chapter 1. It begins by our creation. Genesis 1, 26, 27, the Bible says, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. God, when he gave us his image, he gave us personal autonomy and personal responsibility. Personal responsibility does several things. Number one, it identifies us. Every individual in this room is just that, an individual. If someone were to do something, we could isolate and identify the person that did it because of personal responsibility. In fact, as I came into the building this morning, someone said to me, you came in the back door. I said, I didn't know it was the back door. It was the nearest door. But there was no doubt about who did it. I did it. Because that's the nature of personal responsibility. It identifies us. But not only that, it shows us as independent people. We are free moral agents. When you go to the store to shop for your clothes, aren't you glad you get to decide what you will wear? I know as a young person, whenever we would do summer or we would be in the summer going toward fall and school would be getting ready to to go in, our parents would take us down to the store and they would pick the clothes. And we were always very disappointed with that because they never picked what we, we would tell them, we actually have to wear this stuff and they're going to make fun of us. But they didn't buy for style and fashion. They bought for price and affordability. And so that's the nature of someone else deciding for you. But personal responsibility, personal autonomy is yours. You're independent. It's also noteworthy to note that it's inescapable. At the end of the day, God will hold every one of us accountable, and we don't have to work hard in Scripture to see that. I'm certain you are very familiar with the contents of Genesis chapter 3. I'm certain you're very familiar with the individuals within that context, that there is Adam and there's Eve and there's Satan. And that each one takes actions and does certain things. And that inevitably God comes to Adam and Eve and he asks questions. And those questions are personal and individual. The Bible says they heard the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And God called to the man and said, where are you? Adam said, I was afraid. I hid myself because I heard you. And God said to him, why were you afraid? Have you eaten? A, if you just read through this text, notice the personal pronouns. Notice how often you read words like you and your. Did you eat of the tree? You remember what Adam tried to do, don't you? It didn't take long for Adam to go from this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh to the woman you gave to be with me. She gave me of the tree and I did eat. We call that shifting the blame. It's Genesis chapter 3. We've been doing that for a very long time. Let me ask you this. Did it work? Did God say to Adam, oh, I didn't realize that, but since she gave it to you, then I won't hold you responsible. Don't you read that verse in your Bible? Genesis chapter 3, God is trying to help us understand that personal responsibility is each individual's responsibility to him. 
Secondly, you have to be personally responsible to yourself. You owe you to be honest to you. Have you ever been dishonest with yourself? Don't raise your hand. Don't even say anything out loud. Let's just think on that together. Don't you find sometimes, though, it's possible for you to be dishonest to you? For you to tell yourself things that you know aren't true? Now, you can do that in either good or bad, and very often people do it in a bad sense. People say things about themselves that's just not true. I do a lot of counseling with people, and I tell them, you need to do better self-talk. Don't tell yourself you're good for nothing. Don't tell yourself you can't do anything right. That's actually just not true. But sometimes we deceive ourselves. We aren't honest with ourselves. We have to examine our beliefs. And you need to ask yourself, the Bible encourages and enjoins, examine yourself. Just ask, what do you really believe? Sometimes you hear members of the Lord's church have gone away. They've left the Lord. Sometimes people within the building have already gone away. They just still come. You and I need to constantly examine our beliefs. What do you actually believe? We owe it to ourselves to be good to ourselves. What do you do with you to speak good, to love ourselves? Because the Bible says love others as you love yourself. Sometimes the reason people struggle to love other people is you will find they don't actually love themselves. But personal responsibility would enjoy that. You owe you to love the image God gave you. Thirdly, you need to be personal responsibility to others. You need to practice that. Romans 14 and verse number 7, the Bible says, For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. Ephesians 4 and verse 25, the Bible says, Wherefore put it away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. Why? For we are members one of another. You do appreciate that though you have a personal responsibility to God and to yourself, you also have one to others. We are members one of another. No man is an island. No one lives to himself. No one dies to himself. In fact, sometimes we bristle and are frustrated when people don't exercise care and responsibility toward others. All you have to do is get on the interstate and drive. It's frustrating sometimes. Didn't you see me, we might ask? Very good parenting book, at least portions of it that I read, talked about how the parents teach their children from a very early age that other people live here. It's important when you even go into the restroom to leave it better than you found it, to make sure the next person doesn't have to clean up after you, to be responsible for other people. People. That is the nature of why God created us, and one of the quickest ways to live a very good life is to be personally responsible for yourself. Own the power that's in you that Christ has to change us. Owning personal responsibility embraces God's power to change. We are and we do have shortcomings, but the Bible is about redemption. It's about how God is able to change us and make us better. There is no person beyond the goodness of God. Take a passage like 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, notice what the Apostle Paul says with regards to the Corinthian brethren. He goes there in Acts chapter 18. He preaches the gospel. Many of the Corinthians hearing, believe, and are baptized, Acts 18, 8. If you've never done any study of ancient Corinth to appreciate what kind of city that is, we might liken it to um, one of our huge cities where there is maybe Las Vegas, maybe... um, one of our major cities where it's full of sin and, and, and debauchery. That, that's kind of what Corinth was. In fact, for a person to live immoral, sometimes they were simply said to Corinthianize. That was the nature and state of that city. In fact, as Paul says here, you can see what was going on in Corinth and some of the people that obeyed the gospel. Began reading at verse number 9. Notice that Paul says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. 
And generally, we see those people and those people living those kinds of ways, and we think we should avoid them at all costs. And while we certainly shouldn't go and join them in the way that they're living, we should not also avoid them because they need the very thing you have. They need the gospel. The Bible says Paul went into Corinth and he preached Christ. And when he preached Christ, verse number 11 happened. Paul says, such were some of you. Well, what does that mean, Paul? That means when he went into Corinth, the people he met were practicing the things in verse 9 and verse number 10. After which he preached them the gospel and then they changed. Or rather, Christ changed them. Such were some of you, but you were washed but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. No one is beyond the ability of Christ to help. No one is beyond the pale of Christ to save. Personal responsibility simply says, I'm responsible for what I'm doing, but I want to come to Jesus and have him forgive me for what I've done. I own it. I did it. And God will forgive me if I will obey the gospel. That's personal responsibility. There's a second aspect of personal responsibility. It's closely connected, and that is personal accountability. They're not quite the same because personal responsibility is the individual thing. Accountability tends to be where someone else can kind of hold you to your personal responsibility. That is, someone else can hold you accountable to the things that you say. In 1 Kings 22, verses 1 to 14, there are two kings that want to go to war. One is Ahab and one is Jehoshaphat. Ahab wants to go to war, but Ahab is a wicked king. There are 400 prophets in his, in his court, and they all say to him, go to war. They tell him exactly what they want to hear, what he wants to hear, and that's what they always do. They're false prophets. Jehoshaphat hears this, and he says, is there not one man here? Is there not anybody else that we can ask, anybody else we can hear from? Ahab says, there is one man, but I hate him because he never speaks good concerning me. That man is a prophet named Micaiah. He's a true prophet. And Micaiah comes into the court and actually as he's on his way, you can imagine the two kings are sitting on, the, uh, on their thrones. Micaiah's coming down the hall, and somebody runs out to meet him before he gets in. And when they go out to meet him, they whisper to him. They tell him, now listen, everybody inside has said good things about the king. They've told him exactly what they wanted to hear. When you go in there, you make sure you do the same. This is Micaiah's response. Micaiah said, as the Lord lives, what the Lord says to me, that will I speak. He will hold the kings accountable. It goes all the way through the Bible. You remember when David sinned with Bathsheba? It was another person that came to David, Nathan the prophet, 2 Samuel 12, who told David, first the parable, and then the explanation. David said, the man that has done this thing deserves to die. Nathan said, thou art the man. Is there anybody in your life who can hold you accountable? Is there anybody in your life who can say, you know, you're not keeping your word and you accept it? Is there anybody in your life who can say, you know, you're not doing the right thing here and you reverse your course of action? Is there anybody who can hold you accountable to be personally responsible. Chances are good <clears throat> there's somebody in your life, and chances are good they probably tried. And depending on how you and I respond to that will determine whether or not they'll ever try again. Because sometimes people hold each other accountable, not out of maliciousness, just out of personal responsibility. Listen, you said it and you didn't do it. You gave your word and you didn't follow through. Hey, you need to fix that. That's not the way to do that. You know God wouldn't want you to do that. And you need to be held accountable. And some people, they respond so sharply to that that other people simply say, 
Let them go. I will not risk my head on the chopping block trying to be helpful to this individual who clearly is going the wrong way. They know it. I know it. Others know it. I tried to reach out, help them turn around, but they chewed me up so badly that I will not again try that. Listen, you don't want people to not hold you accountable because that means whenever you go the wrong way, they'll just let you go. You can be greatly helped if you will, one, be personally responsible for your life. You're not a victim. You're not without control. Personal responsibility is a blessing from the Lord. But you also need to be held accountable. If you gave your word, keep it. If you said you would, do it. If you're supposed to be doing, well, then do that. That's personal responsibility and accountability. Number two, spiritual development. You want to have a great life, you need this. You need spiritual development. There are two areas of development in Scripture, two areas of spirituality. The first area is salvation. If a person is not saved, then they have no more pressing need in their entire life than that. Doesn't matter what the economy is doing, it does not matter ultimately. It doesn't matter anything else. Nothing else matters. If your soul is not saved, that is your primary issue in life. We'll talk about death later this week, and I'll probably say this again. But a person who is not saved, if death gets to them before they get to Christ, you don't have the capacity to imagine the horror of that. You, you and I just can't fully grasp it. You cannot appreciate what it means to go to hell. Neither can I, not fully. We can't understand eternal damnation, not in its entirety. We can try, and we will. We'll talk about it. but We'll do the very best we can to describe it, but we'll fall short. But there is no more pressing need. In fact, read it in Scripture. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Listen to the Apostle Paul describe it. This is the first part of spiritual development. If you are not saved, and friends, obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning in verse number 7. The Apostle Paul writes, and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. So that day is coming. At some point, Jesus will come in flaming fire with his mighty angels. At some point, that will happen. When he does, verse number 8 says, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God, and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. What will happen to them, verse number 9 will explain. These, these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. The Bible tells us, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. There are so many incidents in history that help us appreciate the difference in the value of just one day. I have no idea. I can only guess that December 6, 1941 was a day like any other day, but December 7th wasn't. I can only guess and imagine that September 10th was a day like any other day, but September 11th wasn't. There is just one day's difference between the events, and that's the nature of one day. And that's the warning in Proverbs 27, 1. You don't know what's on tomorrow. And so the Bible says, boast not thyself of tomorrow. You don't know what a day may bring forth. Just one day, and the world changes. Just one day, and people go into eternity by the thousands. Just one day. And the day before would have been like any other day. So would it have been before the flood started. So would it have been before Lot left Sodom. So would it have been before the Romans sacked Jerusalem. It would have been just one more day, but it is eternal for many. What will tomorrow be for you? I have no idea, and neither do you, and that's the point. The first aspect of spiritual development is to be saved by our Lord Jesus Christ and his shed blood. 
The reason how to be saved is so important. The reason the gospel is so important is because God only saves one way. And if you don't do that, then, friends, you cannot be covered by the blood of Jesus, and you cannot go to heaven. That's the first part of spiritual development. What's the second part? The second part is sanctification. This is the part for people who are saved. How do I have a great life? I need to grow my faith. I need to develop my spirit. I need to mature in Christ. That's what the Bible describes it as. If you're there near 1 Thess, 2 Thessalonians, turn back to 1 Thessalonians 4 and listen to the Apostle Paul describe it. <clears throat> Beginning in verse number 1, Paul says, Finally, my brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more. You'll notice the words walk in verse number one, and then Paul says here is as you're walking, and we want you to excel more. There's the idea of spiritual growth and development, but keep reading. Paul says, for you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of our Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God. What's God's will for you? What's God's will for his people? Your sanctification. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel, and sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man transgress, defraud his brother in the matter because the Lord is the avenger of all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us to, un, to the purpose of impurity, he says it again, but in sanctification. Three or four times in these seven verses, Paul says God has called us to sanctification. What's he talking about? We started with personal responsibility. Now apply that to your faith. Question, whose responsibility is it for you to grow? Whose responsibility is it for you to mature and produce fruit to God? Whose responsibility is that? Is that the church's responsibility? Is, is that somebody else's, the elders, the preachers, the deacons? Whose responsibility is it to grow your faith? Here's what you do not want to do. You do not want to become a member of the Lord's body. You do not want to come into the assembly of our Lord. And you do not want to make Sunday and Wednesday the totality of my faith. You don't want to do that. Now, unfortunately, we gospel preachers sometimes give you the impression unintentionally that that constitutes faithfulness. That if you are at the worship services, then you're faithful. I certainly won't say that is not a mark of faithfulness, but it would be just that. It would be one manifestation of faithfulness, but it would hardly be the totality of faithfulness. Faithfulness cannot be held to what we do in this building twice a week. Faithfulness more has to do with who we are and how we live seven days a week. Faithfulness has to do with our commitment and dedication to the God, to the God of heaven. When? Every day of our lives. It's not a matter of simply what we do Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. Although, again, one would expect that people would, who are committed to the Lord of heaven, to the God of heaven, would show up to worship. I mean, baseball players do show up to play baseball and basketball players do show up to play basketball. One would think Christians would show up to worship. I don't think we've really reached very high at that point. That's not faithfulness. It's certainly not the totality of faithfulness. But let me ask again, who's going to grow your faith? Who's going to get you closer to the God of heaven? Who's going to help your prayer life? Who's going to help your Bible study? Who's going to do that for you? How do we grow? If you read the Gospel of John, if, if you just, just read through that, those 21 chapters, John will actually tell you at the end of the book why he wrote the book. Chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. John said, truly many other things did Jesus and the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written. So these are written for a very specific reason, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, and that believing you might have faith in his name. That's why the, the gospel of John is so unique in its nature. That book is dedicated to the proclamation that Jesus Christ is the divine Son of God. It's why it starts the way it does. In the beginning was the word. To tell us that the one who became flesh, verse 14, is divine in his nature. Now, when you start to read that book, what you'll find is Jesus constantly talking to people 
about spiritual things and trying to get them to understand spiritual truths. And so in chapter 2, he has a conversation about the temple. He says, destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in three days. And they say, it took 46 years to build this temple. How are you going to raise it in three days? And John would tell us at the end of that chapter, he spoke of the temple of his body. He wasn't talking about brick and mortar. In chapter 3, he'll talk about being born again. And Nicodemus will say, how can a man enter the second time into his mother's womb? Jesus is not talking about physical birth. He's talking about spiritual birth, born of water and of the spirit. In chapter 4, he'll talk about water. He'll be at a well. A woman will have a vessel to draw, and Jesus will say, give me a drink. And she'll say, how are you a Jew talking to me, a woman of Samaria? Jesus said, if you had known who it is that asked you a drink, you would have asked me. I would have given you living water. She said, you don't have anything to draw with, and the well is deep. What kind of water are we talking about? He's talking about his word. He's talking about living water. And this goes on all the way through the book. What's Jesus saying? He says it very plainly in chapter 6 and verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Have you ever read the Bible? I don't mean read at it. I mean, have you ever read it? Have you read it all the way through? I know sometimes people do these yearly Bible reading things. Nothing in the world wrong with it. I'm a fan, absolutely. <coughs> Excuse me. But a whole year? A whole year to read the Bible? Let me ask you this. After you read the Bible, over the course of a year, how much do you retain? How much do you remember what you read? You get to December, you remember, you remember January? You get to October, you remember February? I mean, how, how much? Uh, nothing wrong with the reading. I think sometimes we just sell ourselves short. Did you know? Did you know that you could read the New Testament in 30 days? There's 270 chapters in your New Testament and mine. Breaks down to a little less than nine chapters a day. In nine chapters a day, a little less than that, eight and some change, but nine chapters a day, let's call it rounded. Nine chapters a day, you could read the whole New Testament. Guarantee you, you'd retain a whole lot more in nine chapters. Could you commit to nine chapters a day? Now, I know that's sudden. It's kind of like showing up, as I did many years ago, into the Marine Corps and got to boot camp, and they said, start running. Now, I'd never run like that before in my life. So the suddenness of a thing like that can suddenly be overwhelming. So let's not do that. If that's a lot, and it is, because if you think reading nine chapters a day is a lot, then don't miss a day, because 18 is, <laughs> is much worse than nine. But what if we did this? What if we took two months? What if we took 60 days to read the New Testament? That would be four and a half chapters a day. Four and a half chapters a day over two months, and you could read the entire New Testament. I know, still a lot. I feel like one of those salesmen on TV where they've shown you two deals, and they say, but wait, if you subscribe now, <laughs> what if we took a quarter? What if we took three months, we would be down to three chapters a day. In three chapters a day, over three months, you could read the entire New Testament. Nine chapters for one, four and a half for two, three for three. Anybody? You can do this. What I'm saying is, if you're going to grow your faith, there's no other way to do that than to get into this book and get this book into you. There's no other way. You won't grow your faith the way you want to by simply being here Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday. Absolutely great to do that. Please keep doing that. But that can't be the totality of what you invest. You need more, and only you can do it. Before Bannister broke the four-minute mile, they thought that if he ever did that, anybody ever did that, that literally their heart would just erupt and they would die. Nobody could ever do that. But then Bannister did it. After he did it, last check, 
1,497 people have done it. 1,497 people have broke the four-minute mark. It took one man to do it. Others began to believe they could. No doubt you have heard preachers stand up, sound like they have the whole Bible memorized. And you, sometimes people are amazed at that. I want to let you in on a secret. I'll let you in on a couple of them. I don't mind giving up the goods on preachers. I don't really mind. First of all, you need to give yourself some level of mercy because when you go to your job, he goes to his job. And as you do your job well, well, he spends those same hours doing his job. So on some level, it's not even a fair comparison. He could no more show up one day at your job and do it well than you could show up at his and do it well. On some level, you need to give yourself some level of, of understanding about how that works. But then secondly, you do need to also understand he doesn't have a secret back there. The reason he does that is because he just keeps reading it over and over and over again. Now, let me say very quickly, I've been told by people, well, I don't read well, and I want to be as sympathetic and understanding to that as I possibly can. And so let me suggest this. We have so many technologies, you can hear it. Somebody else will read it to you. There are people, there are programs, there are things available where you can get the message into your mind. You don't have to read it, but you can hear it. You can walk with it. All it takes is for you to make a concerted and diligent effort to make that a priority. And what I'm saying is if you don't make that a priority for yourself, nobody else will. And months will go by, and then years will go by, and then decades will go by, and your faith will not grow. That's one thing. A second thing by way of spiritual development, champion a cause for the Lord that you can do. Sometimes people feel like they can't work for the Lord unless everybody does it, unless we're all in. And so somebody says, you know what, I want to go and take food to this shelter, but I want to make it a church work. Listen, it doesn't have to be a church work. Why don't you just take some food down? When you and I try to make things church works, let me give you again some more secrets. I served as an elder for 12 years at, a, at the previous congregation where I preached. So let me tell you some secrets now about elders. Elders are concerned for the well-being of the flock in totality. They, they know every member and they are concerned for every member, but the greater concern is for the whole. And so if you bring something to an eldership, they will say, okay, we heard you, thank you. And then they will take that thing and set it on the pile of the other 500 things they have to do and think about. And then members will say, well, the elders are so slow. That's on purpose. They can't move at every idea. There's already a pile of stuff. I hope you trust and know they don't get it done every week. There's a pile left. At some point, they just have to go home to their family. And so they come back to it and back to it and then back to it. And by the time they're working on the previous pile, something else comes up. It always does. And then you come in with this great idea. And they say, okay, we will, we'll think about that. We'll work on that. And then time goes by and suddenly you get frustrated and say, why don't the others? Have to, hey, listen, don't take it in there then. If it's something you can do for the Lord, go do that. That thing will be done. When did Christianity become exclusively corporate? When did our understanding of service for the Lord become group think only? Is there time to do things in a group? Absolutely. Should the family get together? Absolutely. Who will direct us and lead us? The elders. But as an individual, there's a neighbor next door in need of help. I know what you could do. Go help. There's somebody sick who needs cards. You know what? Why don't you write some cards? There's a hospital visit that needs to be made. There is a meal I can take. When did you cease to be able to labor for the Lord for you? When did that happen? When did you lose the ability to develop and grow your faith? Write cards. Host a fellowship, share the gospel, read with someone, visit an elderly person who's sick and shut in. Let me tell you something. If we all keep living, we'll one day be elderly. 
And I want you to think about how you treat the elderly. Because one day it'll be you. The elderly have tons and scores of wisdom, and often they get pushed to the side for everybody else and everything else. Oh, we don't need them anymore. We don't need them anymore. They still need you, and they're still useful. And one day you're going to be them. Churches are often, or not very often, short on programs. They're often short on people to participate. But you know what the church's solution for that is? More programs. Likely we don't need more programs. We need more individuals who grow their own faith and develop it in the Lord. We read about Aquila and Priscilla, husbands and wives. Couldn't y'all use y'all marriage to glorify God? Couldn't y'all be Aquila and Priscilla? Young and old, young people, I know y'all have fantastic ideas. I know y'all can touch people that other people can't touch. I know there are things you can do. Can't y'all host people at y'all house? Let's have them over to our house. I don't know where I am now. I think I'm on number three. Number three, determine to develop a realistic spiritual perspective. I know that's a mouthful, so I'll say it again. Want to have a great life? Make it up in your mind. I'm going to develop in my mind a realistic spiritual outlook on life. There are some people who see problems with everything. In fact, that's all they see. They see a problem with their birthday. You know birthdays are supposed to be joyous occasions, but some people say birthdays, ah, I hate them. Really? Let me get this straight. You hate the day you were born. Man, I think you should work on that. Instead of complaining, why don't we celebrate another year God has gifted us? 364 days elapsed, and then your day came. That means you were blessed with 364 before it. Instead of being thankful, they complain. Some folks have problems about the weather. It doesn't matter. Weather is, is unpredictable, but, of course, nobody knows that. Nobody knows the weather is unpredictable, so we get actually angry that it is unpredictable. But don't we all know that? Don't we all know they're guessing, doing the very best they can with all of their radars to guess? And yet people are upset. Some people, it's too hot. Others, it's too cold. Then it's too wet. Now it's too dry. Where do you want to live? Why don't you pick that place and then go enjoy the weather there? What you constantly say reveals what you constantly think. And the Bible enjoins upon us not to be murmurers and complainers. Let's read it together. It's Philippians chapter 2. In fact, if you want a great book on, on a perspective and outlook, that would be the book. The Apostle Paul gives just great insight into the proper way to interpret life, ups and downs, ins and outs, goods and bad. He just is as steady as can be right through it all. In chapter 2 and verse 14, he says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Sometimes when we're reading the Bible, it's possible to read over words, it's possible to miss words, it's possible to miss words or change words while reading them correctly. For instance, in your Bible, let me ask, does it say do all things without grumbling or disputing, or does it say do most things or many things? It can't mean all, can it? I mean, I know it says it, but it, it can't. Yeah, it does. It says just what it means. It just means what it says. Do all things. How? Without murmuring and complaining, King James says, grumblings and disputings. What you're showing to the world in your thoughts, in your words, in your deeds, that's what you're showing. You're showing your heart. You're revealing it. And friends, let me ask you, shouldn't having Jesus in your life be different than not having Jesus? Shouldn't he make a difference? I mean, here's person A, they don't have Jesus. We would say, now that's a person of the world. Okay. So in this person of the world, we might hear them complain and murmur. In this person of the world, we might see them cut corners. In this person of the world, we might see them stressed out and, 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 and just absolutely in despair. We might see that. Why? It's a person of the world. Got it. But here's person B, and they have Jesus. 
please tell me we all agree that they shouldn't be the same, should they? I mean, they shouldn't talk the same. They shouldn't think the same. They shouldn't live the same. There should be some identifiable difference between the two. They both live in the world, yes, and so the world happens to both of them. Matthew 7, 24 to 28, the rain falls on both houses. I got it. But when the rain falls on the person with Christ, they have Christ. That's Paul's point in the book of Philippians. Read a few passages with me. Go back to Philippians 1. Look at chapter 1, verse 12. Paul says, now, bear in mind, Acts 16, this is an individual who has been arrested, beaten, and thrown in prison. And he writes these words from that vantage point. And he says in verse number 12, now, I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren trusting the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Wait a minute, Paul. What kind of perspective is that? Acts 16, 25, if you had been in that prison at midnight around that time, you would have heard singing and praying, not murmuring and complaining. And when he writes about it, he says, brethren, let me tell you all something. Now, this is the man in jail writing to people who are free. And he says, the things that have turned out to me, they've helped the gospel. You know what? They have given me an absolute audience that can't go anywhere. Can you imagine a preacher with an audience that couldn't leave? Paul is just happy as a pig in slop. Let me tell you something. I'm in this prison and they can't go anywhere either. Guess what they're going to hear? He says not just them, but the guards. Everybody knows why I'm in here. But Paul goes a step further and he says, listen, the brethren who are out there, when they saw the way we handled it, they took courage. Let me ask you this. When you go through stress and trial and difficulty, what do people see? What do people feel? If you were in the prison, you would have heard singing and praying. If you were in the prison, you would have heard preaching. If you were in the prison, you would have heard a man saying, listen, this is falling out for the furtherance of the gospel. There's a good thing here and a good thing to be done. Did he want to be in prison? No. Did he want to be beaten? No. But can you control everything in your life? So what do you do when you are in circumstances that you didn't create and that somebody else has caused and now you're in it? Is this the time to murmur and complain? Not if you have a spiritual proper perspective. The reality of life is life's not fair. Let's all accept that and let's move on. The reality of life is people don't always do right. Got it. So I should probably stop going to the grocery store looking for perfection. I should probably stop going to every restaurant and demanding perfect execution by the waiter or waitress. But there are Christians who, without the right perspective, demand that the world behave like Jesus while they often don't. We got to three or six. I realized that that last sentence or two sounded like I was yelling. Not, re not really what I meant to do. <laughs> but we, we can have a great life if we just live like Jesus. Be personally responsible. Allow somebody to hold you accountable. There's nothing wrong with that. We have to be able to grow our faith. And please take possession of your faith and grow closer to the Lord. And then let's have a, a proper, optimal, spiritual outlook on life. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Look forward to being with you this week.